Hey everyone, I'm very excited to welcome you to our DevOps panel. Have, have some more d'oeuvres, have some beer, have some wine. Uh, we're going to have a great conversation here. Uh, before we get started, I'm going to do a little bit of shameless promotion. Uh, my team uh, worked in the developer relations group. Uh, we, we support the community. We just recently built a DevOps community, which is part of the excitement of the, all of this. Um, you can go, you can find it on the Cisco communities, uh, or you can use the short URL, cs.co slash DevOps dash community. We have some blogs, we have some uh, knowledge base articles, we're starting some conversations, and we really want to get everyone involved. And that's part of why we're here too, is that we want to get everyone, to, you know, community is not just an online thing, it's, it's everybody, it's us getting together, so uh, enjoy. One other thing I wanted to share is that we do have a raffle in this. So uh, I will show this again at the end. At the end of this presentation, we're going to have a drawing and, uh, the, and one winner will get a, a 100 euro uh, gift store thing for the Cisco store. Um, again, we'll show this at the end and what, when you bring it up on your phone, there'll be a, a DevOps question for you to answer. And uh, the, I guess the first person, I guess it's a raffle, so I guess they pull, they pull one from the correct answers and they'll, one person will get the thing. All right, here is our panel today. I'm Paul Zimmerman. I uh, am the manager of the de uh, developer community engagement team in the developer experience group. Uh, I guess, should I introduce you guys or do you want, or do you want uh, me to introduce you? I'll, I'm ha I'll do it. I'll introduce you guys and then we'll have questions for you. Right next to me, we have uh, Mateus Pro Prokop from Natilic. Natilic has been a huge partner for Cisco and for the DevNet team. They were one of our first uh, DevNet specialized partners, and uh, it's really great to have Mateus here on our panel. Uh, next, we have Julio Gomez. Julio is a principal sales architect for Cisco, and he's like one of the superstars in Europe for sure. So I'm sure every, everyone here knows who Julio is. And then of course, on the end, we have uh, Hank Preston. Everyone knows Hank. Hank's super famous as well. So, uh, <laughs> I, oh, yo, you're, you're famous in your own, in your own way. <laughs> so I'm very honored to have this panel here. And uh, let's get started. I have some questions for him. And we'll have a great conversation. All right, the first, one I have, the first question I have here is for you, Hank. So we have a DevNet certification in DevOps. Um, and I know that you guys have been doing a whole lot of stuff in Cisco U around promoting a lot of the certifications. Um, how do you see the DevOps certifications helping people build their skills for real world implementations? Uh, wonderful, I do want to clarify one thing. I'm not famous <laughs> at all, right? I, I joke with my son, he's like, oh, you're Cisco famous. I'm like, that, that's, that's better, right? A very small niche of the world. And I'm not famous, for God's <laughs> sakes, please don't say that. Um, so certifications and being prepared for the industry and jobs are out there. It's something we've talked about all the time, and there's constantly this like swaying back and forth. Are certifications worth it? And then the naysayers come out and say, absolutely not, you just need experience. Um, I don't think it's as easy as saying whether certifications are worth it or not. Um, for some people, certifications are fantastic. Certifications did a lot for my career going through. I started with the CCNA certification, uh, then I lost it, and then I had to go earn it again. Uh, anybody else have to do that, or was I the only one that had to go earn the darn thing twice? Um, what I like about certifications, even outside of just, I, I mean, I like having a certification. It looks great, you get the plaque and all those other pieces that go through. But you have to learn skills to do jobs. And those skills we have to learn are changing constantly. Right? They're constantly evolving. And today, particularly today, there's no lack of information uh, that you can use to learn. There's no lack of videos and blogs and courses and labs and people with opinions. And sometimes it's just hard to figure out what to learn. Right? I'm interested in DevOps. What do I need to learn? How do I get started? And that's where I honestly think certifications have a real value, is because the certifications, if you can find one that aligns to the type of work, the type of job you want, that gives you a blueprint. It gives you a roadmap on the skills you need to learn. And so now I have a list. This is what I need to learn. And then even better, because people want to earn certifications, people, we've gone out and we've built material courses that will teach you those skills that are there. 
And so in the DevOps space, if you're trying to get into DevOps, particularly we'll say infrastructure DevOps, because there's different flavors that are out there, um, you can look at the DevOps blueprint, which is part of the DevNet certifications we have in learning and certification. And it has a set of skills, things that we expect somebody in the DevOps space to know. Infrastructure as code concepts, containers concepts, information around CI, CD. And then you can use the learning materials, the digital learning pieces we've put together, the links to excuse me, some of those blogs and webinars and videos that kind of dive into those areas as a place to kind of get, get some signal out of noise. Because you can really, I mean, you could, spend, you could spend an hour of your study time just trying to figure out what to study. But if you've got that blueprint, that roadmap, it can give you the alignment. Now that said, certifications and these courses are not enough to go through. It's a start, it's a place for a foundation. You use that and you build on top of it. My favorite part, uh, about studying for something new in a certification is you start down a blueprint for something and you're like, oh, that's really interesting. Let me dive a little deeper because the blueprint only asks for this piece, but boy, that was really interesting. Can I learn this? And hey, there's this other question. So it gives me a place to go, but I can come back to the blueprint assuming that I do want to earn the certification. Uh, certifications still do show up on job descriptions, maybe not every job description that's out there, but we still do see employers and managers and IT leadership and certainly HR places need a way to set expectations. What do people need for this role that's out there? And certifications are valuable in that fashion. So, how was that? That was excellent. Whew. I was nervous. All right, back to you, Paul. All right. The next, uh, thank, thanks, Hank. Uh, the next question I have is for you, Julio. Um, being a sales architect, from a sales perspective, how do you see the use of DevOps practices driving purchasing decisions? I think that's a great question. Um, and I think there are a couple of angles, at least, that um, make DevOps relevant to any kind of purchasing decisions, but specifically also for our network infrastructure, which is kind of the common background that we have uh, from the networking environment. Um, a couple of topics. One of them is how developers have become king makers, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's only it's only this small group of people that get to develop whatever line of business owners want to have to communicate with a global audience. Developers are the ones that execute on that. So developers are really interested in DevOps because that helps them in their life. You know, that helps them with their daily tasks. That helps them with the way that they create those um, specific applications that they use with line of business owners. And the great thing, or the different thing I would say, and, and it was Hank, the one that told me once, that developers do not speak VLAN. And I, I just remember that very vividly, like everyone speaks VLAN. What do you mean you don't speak VLAN? What do you mean you're not spending your days debugging a spanning tree protocol loops? I, I thought the whole world revolved around that. But it, it, it looks like that was not the case. And developers do not care about your OSPF background. They, that, that's not what they live and breathe. They speak a different different slang. Um, so if you want to talk to developers and actually bring something to address their daily challenges, you need to speak their language. And that's what DevOps is. DevOps is um, a different approach into solving the problems that they have ever, that they have had forever. So if you want to learn about DevOps, you are going to be able to tackle and address a new set of opportunities with with kind of different departments, you know? Because usually IT departments, the ones that we usually deal with, are optimized for cost, right? If they spend less while providing the service, management is happy. While line of business owners are optimized for revenue. If they generate more revenue, they can spend more. So that means that there are a lot of opportunities that are usually untackled when you just talk to the IT departments. So if you want to untackle, if you want to tackle those opportunities, you really need to talk and speak the language. You need to bring something different to the table. So learning about DevOps really brings you that ability. It's something that is not natural for us network engineers. It's not, it's not an evolution of VLAN and spanning tree. It's not an evolution of OSPF. It's something different. And you need to make a conscious effort to morph yourself into that kind of new profile. So that's on, that's on one side. That's, that's kind of if you want to tackle those opportunities. But I think that there is an, an additional point of view here, which is you can apply the same kind of DevOps principles into your network configuration and management. And that's very powerful because applications 
the services that our customers are trying to implement every single day are composed usually by software at the application level and changes in the configuration in the infrastructure, in the network. So what good is it if I'm very fast at implementing my software features, if then I cannot deploy it because it takes two weeks for the networking people to actually implement the required changes in the infrastructure? So applying those same kind of principles on automation, on automation pipelines, you know, the same, isn't the same, even the same tool set, enables a faster time to market for the end-to-end -end services, and that makes all the difference in the world in terms of how to reduce churn for partners, for example, servicing end customers, or for customers serving end clients. Uh, at the end of the day, it's all about how to differentiate against the competition, and I think that the NetDevOps approach helps everyone managing infrastructure differentiate against the competition. Thanks, Julio, awesome. Mateus, time for a question for you. So DevOps and automation uh, are one of the key technologies that Natilic fo focuses on. Uh, you help your customers build out automation and software tools to bring DevOps into their businesses. Uh, how has embracing DevOps helped build your customers' businesses? Hi, I'm Matthias. I'm only Natalik famous. I'm not even Cisco famous. Uh, so it's like much smaller famous. So probably not, no one knows me. Um, thank you, Julio, for like using the terms like revenues and stuff. I was worried that I will be the only one who's like using these kind of like, you know, weird commercial words. Uh, because that's where I'm like spending loads of my time lately. I think, you know, to your question, like we're moving from the conversation with like our clients from like, you know, oh, how I can automate this and that into the conversation like, and so what? Like, you know, what is DevOps? Like, you know, how is it going to help me, the company? Like, what does it mean in terms of the revenues? Like, you know, are we going to be more profitable as a company? Is it going to speed up things uh, so we can save the cost on the people? These are the questions and I think these are the expectations from our clients, how it helps to their business. I wish I would have the answer to your question. I think we would have to ask the the business, you know, the our clients directly. But I can judge like from us internally because Natalik, we do something which we call Natalik platform or Natalik cloud. So we're using loads of like DevOps methodology into how we are managing internal platform. Uh, and we've seen, you know, uh, just to give you the clear metric, like we've seen, for instance, speeding up of onboarding new clients on our platform from six weeks to six days. So we're seeing you know, major sort of e-savings in terms of cost of our resources. Uh, we have a team of just four people who are managing the platform, which is global. Uh, I think each side has about like 100 leaves or something. So it's a pretty big scale. And we're able to manage it with the four people centrally in London. And uh, we're managing four sides globally, uh, APEC, Europe, US, and the second one in APEC. Um, so, uh, that's probably like what I do know how DevOps is helping to the business. But obviously, you know, like the conversations which we're having and we are starting to proving, like it takes time, right? Like we're talking about the DevOps for like last three, four years, seriously, I would say, and clients are starting to adopting it. And I think only now we're starting to seeing some results, some ROI. Um, so we have some numbers which we are using as a case study. So if you go to notsley.com, we have some case studies in there where we showcasing like you know how much savings we we uh, did with DevOps to our clients, and that's probably what uh, you know you can use as a metric like how it helps to the business. To be fair, like obviously there are like these like beside stuff which is kind of like ignored sometimes, but I think it's really important. What I'm seeing is about like how people are feeling fulfilled. Like, you know, if you if you are building this DevOps culture, it's not necessarily about the ROI in terms of like, you know, I'm seeing these revenues as the extra, but I'm seeing like actually my team is happy, people are staying, people are being educated, so uh, that helps as well. So I think that's uh, that's another like outcome for the business from the DevOps perspective. Thanks, Mateus, awesome. Uh, Julio, when we were, you were talking a little bit earlier, you mentioned uh, tools as, as a, a topic that was uh, something interesting. I mean, of course, there's tons of tools that you use in DevOps. There's Git and Jenkins and Puppet and Ansible and all sorts of different ones you use for different parts of the of the tool chain. Um, what have you found? Have you found any new tools that you found to help DevOps practitioners? Um, I got to confess that um, a lot of the people, uh, my, my friends back home, uh, are 
pure software developers, like, like the real thing. Even with um, companies that are in Y Combinators, round of investment, you know, Series B, like, like proper developers. So, so I benefit from learning about what they care about and what are the tools that they're using. I think that the, the, common, the common goal, I would say, for each one of them is, how can I just find something that is um, efficient, uh, replicable, uh, so something that is consistent, uh, something that is integrated with the whole workflow that I have, so that I can focus on my code. You know, I, I don't want to learn about anything else. You know, and, and that's where the the search for the final tool set comes from. Like, like I really want to understand what's what's in there, and they are constantly evaluating things. But but always with that goal, you know, have, having something that is efficient, replicable, and integrated. Um, and I remember back in the day, you know, when, when they were developing and they were developing on their own computer, and that was certainly efficient, but not very replicable or integrated with anything. And you, you got the classic message that it works on my computer, so you deal with, you know, your side, just make it replicable yourself. And that's where we started evaluating other things like, like Vagrant, you know, where, where you have a virtual machine, where you have the complete system. That's certainly replicable, but at a, at a, at a very high cost. You know, it, it, it's, it's very heavy, um, definitely not integrated with anything, definitely not, not efficient from that point of view. And then we went into you know, the world of Docker and containers where we start slicing the application and creating microservices and, and you know, you start playing out with, with, with the containers. And Docker was great, it was a great advance, I would say, from, from that previous situation with Vagrant with virtual machines and so on and the local systems. But still, Docker was not integrated with anything. It was just lightweight. It was more efficient. But, but you were not really going anywhere in terms of uh, repli uh, sorry, uh, replicable, but not efficient. And definitely not something that you can integrate with anything. So Kubernetes get in. I remember being uh, with this guy in Amsterdam or something like that. And they got the news that the Borg you know, had, had been open source. And now, suddenly, Kubernetes was a de facto standard. It's like, what? We, we haven't invested in something else. So, yeah, our hours were like gone because suddenly it's like this new tool that we need to use. So Kubernetes was great and, and it helps you with um, making replicability a step farther, but it's definitely not efficient for a developer because that now he needs to learn about Kubernetes, which is not easy. You know, the, the constructs are, you know, a little bit of abstractions that you need to deal with. And definitely something that you need to have a cluster, and nobody has a cluster just to play with. So you need a local one in your computer, need more resources. Not the right approach. And definitely not integrated with anything as well. So what I've noticed in the last years is that there's been a plethora of, of new tools that have exactly that goal in mind, which is let developers try to focus only on development. Not on anything else. And we, have, we are just back from the Istio session where we were just talking about this, uh, about how you can just use a service mesh to you know, extract some of that functionality and, and, and do it on the side. But from the development standpoint, you don't, wanna, you don't, you don't even want to manage any Docker or Kubernetes or nothing like that. You want to focus on your Python or your JavaScript or C++ or whatever. You just want to focus on that. So the latest tools that I've, that I've learned to, um, to use in the last years have been focused, for example, I, I think there's, there's one called Draft from, from Microsoft that is focused on um, how you can focus on your code and then you just run a command called Draft App and suddenly your images are built and they are published and they are deployed into the production network. And that's beautiful. But the problem is that you need to be running Docker locally to to create those images, and then you need to do the Docker push, and then it needs to be updated, and then you need to manage your Kubernetes. It's like, yeah, it's, 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 it's good, but it's not, not good enough. So we moved from draft into something called scaffold, because a scaffold was a little bit more complex, but it was not manual. You, needed, you, do, you didn't need to do draft up. You know, it was like it detected that you had just made the changes, and suddenly it was somewhere. But still, you needed to run Kubernetes, Docker locally, the, the, the Helm package manager. You needed to do a lot, of, a lot of stuff. And again, developers do not care about that. They don't, they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to have a local class or nothing like that. So from there, we moved into something else, which is called telepresence. And telepresence was kind of this 
black sorcery tool <laughs> where I didn't even understand how it worked, but, but you had the opportunity to replace a deployment that was in a remote cluster with something that was running in your local computer transparently. Suddenly, the traffic was through the ingress in the cluster, and it was coming to your laptop. It was using the microservice in your laptop and then going back there. Wow. I mean, we were flabbergasted. Like, this is really cool. This is really amazing. And you could also replace some, develop, that, some deployment. That, that was really, really cool. But we found the ultimate tool, I think it was a couple of years ago, something called Octeto. And Octeto is even more you know, sorcery. You, you, you don't really understand how it goes. But, but the, the key thing is that it synchronizes your file system where you have your code, the, the file system where, where your code resides in your local computer. It's automatically, automatically synchronized with the remote cluster. So as soon as you save the file, it's automatically reflected in the production cluster. So this is nirvana for developers because that's what they were looking for. They don't have any Kubernetes, they don't have any Docker, they don't have anything but their code running in their IDE. They use their tools, they don't need to be concerned about anything. So those are kind of the tools and the evolution that we have seen in the last years from the old days of my own laptop, throwing it over the fence and you deal with it, to these days where we have tools like the ones that I've mentioned, like Octeto, for example, where it's completely transparent and it allows developers to focus on their code. Yeah, it was the. Your, I, I kept waiting to see where the end of that story was, Julio. I was like, when do we? It's like you buried the lead. Like, just tell me where are we going? I hadn't heard of some of those tools that were in there. That was kind of neat. Um, I'm curious. One of the things that. So my, my day job these days is a lot of, uh, kind of back internally helping our team that manages some of the infrastructure behind our systems over in learning and certification. And, and I always am afraid of tool fatigue sometimes. You're constantly changing what's out there. I, I know how I deal with it with our team on the infrastructure side, but I'm curious, those pure software developers that are there, I agree, you want to focus on just what's important to you and kind of move all the noise around. But how do you balance the need to just eventually just do the work that's there, even if it's, if it's using maybe a non-ideal or not the latest tool that's there. How, how are your friends that are the developers actually choosing how much time to spend investigating all of these new things that are there? Because I, 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 I sometimes feel like, a, like the old fogey, which is weird for me to say, because I've been pushing kind of these automation things for so long. But I'm, all, I, I'm often, like I need, I need some of my engineers to stop like experimenting and looking at new things, because I have these things that actually have to get done. So how do, how do other developers and folks realize, or, or balance that action of having to actually deliver something and have something work, versus just, oh, there's this new thing that I just saw. Let me see how it works, or experiment, or build people. Like, how are, how are your friends dealing with that? I'm, I'm honestly just curious. So they gave me a mic, so I'm going to ask a question. <laughs> Do not leave the mic with Hank. It's, it's, it's always trouble. Um, yeah, so, so the, the thing is that these guys, the pure developers, are not even investigating any of this. It's more about the SREs in the company. Those are the ones really evaluating all of these tools just to make their developers' life easier. And we talk about this loop of feedback that we have you know, with CICD pipelines and how developers and operations just work together. I think this is kind of one of those things where SREs, you know, um, the people in operations, are actually evaluating things, new tools, that might be providing value to their developers to make their lives easier. Um, I think it's a little bit unfair, you know, when we have been describing DevOps, like, hey, we give all the responsibility to the developers, and it's their task, you know, to push things into production, and then we, oper we uh, the, the people from operations are like, no, it's not my problem, you know, I just, give, I just gave you the tool set to actually, you know, go into production yourself. If there's a problem, you deal with it. So um, SREs in this kind of environments are the ones evaluating, and then they propose to the developers, they bring the value, which is, hey, you don't need to have Docker. You don't need to have uh, Kubernetes. You don't even need to learn the CLI. You don't even need to have the cluster. You will just have to focus on what is important for our business. And that's what make them fall in love with the solution. Matthias, do you have anything to add to that? Or do you yeah, I think you know there is there is a place for the partner for this as well, right? Um, I think we're being asked like so many times by our clients, like you know, what about that tool and this tool, um, and uh, we're here for the clients to sort of like giving some guidance in terms of what tools 
uh, they should be using. Uh, and it's, yeah, sometimes it's like, you know, so many tools. It is insane. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's the main problem. Like, you know, like basically different teams are using different tools and it solves lots of issues to sort of like bring the teams. And it's also like benefit of us as a partner. We usually, like these teams, usually sometimes they have a clashes between each other. Like we're usually entering as someone neutral and almost that one team is asking, can you please bring that another team? Like, you know, they don't want to talk to us about these tools. Can you please like, you know, be that guy in the middle and just like say like which one is better for us? So, uh, yeah. Thanks. And actually, I have a, another question for you. I mean, when you were talking previously, you mentioned uh, DevOps as a culture. And a lot of people look at DevOps as a culture rather than a just a set of skills or something else or, you know. Uh, so uh, how, how can we grow a culture of DevOps in organizations? Yeah, so in my opinion, all like, you know, these like past few years, there's like two angles to DevOps. So like you speak to engineering and they see the culture. You speak to leadership and they see obviously money. So like their second question is like, so what? Like, you know, DevOps, so what? Like what is what is it gonna bring to us? Like is it gonna, you know, make us more profitable or like whatever is gonna be the outcome? So you have a sort of like a two different conversations and I think that's really important to clarify these questions first for everyone, for the like, you know, those like from the top down and from the down to the top. Uh, and after you define that outcome, then you can start defining the culture. So I agree, it is a culture, but there needs to be outcome to like what you are trying to achieve with that culture because like, implementing the culture for the sake of the culture, it doesn't really change anything. Uh, and it usually like, you know, like vapor, like, you know, it's just like, you know, goes away uh, if you don't have that like, you know, clear outcome. Um, so that's what we are like seeing with uh, lots of our clients recently, uh, the adoption, how important it is to sort of reset that culture in the company. So we're helping to have like, you know, clear waypoints and a path for our clients to sort of like, have some certain like you know outcomes and milestones uh, through the years, and building that culture inside inside of the company. So uh, yeah, it is a culture, but there needs to be the outcome to that culture. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Anyone else want to talk about culture, or we we, we can move on? Okay. Um, all right, Hank, I have one for you. So chat ops, AI, AI ops, and no ops are practices that put more and more automation into the ops side of things. Um, with apps like ChatGPT coming out, becoming more mainstream, how, how do you think artificial intelligence is relevant in DevOps uh, to up to this point, and how do you see AI influencing DevOps in the next five to 10 years and beyond? Futurist question. <laughs> That's really hard. Yeah. Oh my God. I, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm often accused of being like the Peggy practical that's out there. And I, I look at some of these buzzwords that are in place and I know there's use cases that are there that, but I'm, I'm yet to figure out how they're fully going to fit in. Um, the chat GPT thing has been really interesting to see. It's the first one that I've looked at that said, okay, that that's like, seems like a fairly big step in a direction where we're seeing things. Um, I also think that it's, it's like um, it's like machine Googling, right? That's the impression I get out of it. It's, it's, it's a really nice way. Like it's automated the ability to Google and then build like intelligent sentences around that. Um, we were talking um, with some of my coworkers about how we could use some of these things that are in there. And, and there was an example, well, we want to use chat GPT to write marketing announcements for our pieces. And I was like, and someone, someone else made this point. I'm not going to take the, the, the credit for it, but it's a really good point. So you're, you're going you're gonna to give something to a tool to create marketing announcements, and they're, they're, it's going to use all of the existing marketing information to generate new... So it's this recursive loop that goes in. And so when I look at the things like chat, GBT, machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, at least in the stage today, it'll, it'll eventually get to that point where those are really learning on their own and becoming creativity. But that, I think, is what's missing from a lot of these pieces today. And what, where the humans still have value into these areas is the creative problem solving. And that's the value that I see for myself. And, and when I look out there is, 
is our ability to look at a problem kind of outside the box, find non, non-obvious connections, and, and add creativity and pieces in there, I have no doubt eventually AI will get there, right? At some point, machine overlords, when you're watching this video later on YouTube, I'm on board, like bring it on. Um, please don't kill me with like the HVAC and my system shutting off or whatever. But I think that we're, we're a ways still to get to that spot. So where I see the, the machine learning, the artificial intelligence coming in is, is allowing us to get to answers faster because there's so much information out there, it's hard to process it. And so that's where I want to see these tools be used. Give me an ability to, to signal to noise, like figure out, like find some of the obvious patterns that are there. But I'm never going to be able to like hand over, at least not yet, like the, those big areas, the, the spots for like, what's gonna drive more revenue? How can we be more creative? Um, those are the pieces that, that I, I don't think we have those yet. Um, and that's where I, where I think we still need to focus on ourselves, like solving those problems. Because at some point, automation will solve problems that are there. I mean, autom- we've seen it for years and years and years. Things that we used, we used to pay people to like sit at a chair and like take a cord and plug it into a dot to connect like two people on a phone call. And then we've moved on from there. And it's more of the same. We're just heading there. And we have to figure out what, 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 where are we needed in the area. Um, at some point, we won't be needed for those either. And then we can just uh, sit in big floaty chairs and like eat Cheetos or something. But it's a long time from now, at least in my view. Though I'm, I, all of the real futurists that are super on board with all the ops and the AIs, and the, I'm sure they're going to tell me I'm crazy and, and super just like out there. But I, don't, I look at what's there, and I haven't seen any of them. There's so many things where they just call it ML or AI and they wrap it on something and it's, it's not there yet. I haven't seen the, the, the super pieces. So which one of you are going to tell me I'm wrong? It's going to be Matthias. I'm not going to say you're wrong. I love it. Like, you know, I love chat GPT. Like, you know, I was like reading it the whole Christmas. My wife, you know, after two days, she told me, can you please shut up and don't talk, you know, let's talk about like Christmas, not chat GPT. I love it. I love when somebody who's talking about it says it will never I love that. Like, you know, it's nothing against you, Hank, but it's like when somebody says, like, it will never, I'm always like, will it really? Like, it's just like, it just makes me thinking, like, you know, how difficult it would be to, like, actually, it will do it. And uh, there's been just, like, announcement yesterday about, like, when you said about the revenues and stuff, I think there's been, like, this video of, uh, like, I don't know, like, maybe Microsoft, like, reporting the results and basically, like, he wrote the sentence like, can you please summarize how did they achieve the high revenues? And it gave the like response like why exactly they achieved those high revenues. So it's just like, you know, it's, it's slowly getting there. It's not there yet, but like, and I, yeah, it's, it's just exciting. Like, you know, how we will be able to use the chat GPT uh, in the future. There will be this new open AI release for, uh, I think this year or like, you know, middle of this year. So loads of exciting things. I don't know how this is going to be applying to what we're doing. Uh, we're seeing how it's applying already to coding, for instance. Like you can literally, like you know, build the snippets, so uh, you don't have to go to Stack Overflow, but you literally, like you know, ask the chat chatbot to, to to do it for you, which is like insane. Like you know, who would say like even two years ago, like we will be able to like generate the code or computer will be able to generate the code, which is pretty reliable. I was testing it so many times, and it's like scary good, like. <laughs> There are like there are typos in it, but like who built a code from the first? Like you know, I build a code and there are mistakes, there are typos. So you know, it's basically like on the level uh, of my like small brain. Maybe you guys are better than well, definitely you're better than I do. Uh, but you know, how is it going to apply to what we're doing? I don't know. I can't wait to release this video five years later and uh, just see like you know how off or like you know how well we've been. Like, oh, like in in a company because the you know me being a director, like people are asking me like you know what we should be doing next year, what's gonna be happening in the technology, and I'm always saying like I wish I would know what's gonna be on the market in six months, like you, you know I'm just like placing the bets. That's what I'm doing. I'm trying to be smart in placing. I'm playing a poker, but essentially like you know, pe- placing the bets like you know uh, reasonably. Uh, what's gonna be in five years with this? I don't know. Like what is it gonna do? I don't know. But uh, it's it's really good, and I'm excited about it. I mean, I, I think in five years from now, these conferences are going to be very different because the panelists is going to be like chat GPT and Google's version of it. And all of the audience members are going to be all of the other AIs. And they're just going to be talking to each other because the rest of us are just at like the bar, right? It's like, I've got my AI assistant is actually attending the conference for me. So. I like it. I like that. It's, there is this video, like lady interviewing chat GPT. 
and it like that it's even like it has a face and it's scary and it's like i when i see it, i was like this is the end of this is the end of us awesome. sorry <laughs> Awesome. I think we have time for one more, but before we do that, I'm just going to bring this uh, this up. Um, we do have a raffle happening at the end of this. If you scan that that uh, QR code, um, maybe we separate a little bit so you guys can so they can scan it. Um, there's going to be a DevOps question when you scan this, and uh, so please answer the question, and a winner will get the uh, the winner will be announced at the end of this session. So. But we have one more. Oops, I don't want that to go yet. We need to leave that there. Um, but so we have one more question to go. What's that? Oh, yeah. Let's do that. Let's do that. Uh, anyone have a question out here? Yeah, and the beer. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think Julio uh, uh, alluded to. The idea that SRE is supposed to be helping developers in terms of the tooling and making it more consistent. And I was wondering about uh, organiz how organizational design kind of plugs into the DevOps culture. Because obviously, SRE, there's a level of, uh, no matter how flat you're trying to make the organization, there's a level of organizational separation. And maybe the idea of dry, do not repeat yourself, being applied not to just code, but also to how people work in those teams. Maybe some thoughts on that. Um, it's funny that you mention it, because I think in the last year at least, we have received a number of requests from companies asking, hey, do you have any kind of services that can help us drive that cultural change? Because, because any kind of tool set that you present is like, it's doable. You know, we can, we can start working on it and we can evaluate it and we can even maybe implement it. But the cultural change and the associated organizational change, that's big. That's not easy at all. That's not easy to convince anybody. And especially because Matthias made the perfect point. What is the business outcome? You need to demonstrate that it's really worth it. Because you start, you know, filling your mouth with the two pizza team. So yeah, two pizza team, what? I mean, why? So the business justification, the business outcomes are really what everyone looks for. And I think that at a certain point, it's all about inspiration. So unless you see someone, your neighbor being successful, you don't want to jump in and be the first one, right? But, but the moment that you see someone actually delivering on that promise, that's when you realize that, it, that it's, um, that it's um, something worth, worth it. Um, I remember when uh, there were some um, testimonials from Google um, talking about the big cultural change that, that Borg implied, you know, when they were releasing Kubernetes, how it changed the, work, the, the, the way that they were working, because basically it was impossible to do it any other way. So I think that eventually companies will get into that phase where it's impossible to scale up anymore. You know, our resources are so... So, so devastated by the amount of workload that we have to do that, that, that it's impossible to manage things at scale. Uh, it will be at that point that they will need to start evaluating that kind of cultural change. Um, as of today, even for the companies that are looking for help with that kind of organizational changes, it's difficult to provide that service because the business outcomes need to be so clear as to get the CEO of the company saying, yeah, let's go for that. Let's change a complete organization. Let's really focus on delivering in a different way. Man, that's big. So yeah, I don't have the answer. I can just talk about what I'm seeing and it looks like you need to arrive to that phase naturally, organically. Um, and any kind of references inspiration is beautiful. So I don't have a magic answer for this, but I was trying to think, like, how do you actually make the change? And one thing Julio said kind of gave me a kind of a spark of inspiration and even tying back to what we're doing internally. Um, I know how to drive from my house, like, to other places. And I generally go the same way every time because I know it. It's easy. The only time I change the path I have to go is when construction happens and I can't go the same way, right? I have to make a change. And Julio mentioned, like, there has to be a forcing factor. And we've seen this internally. On my, I've, I've been working for, like, three years to make drastic cultural changes and technology changes. And we've struggled because 
despite all of the benefits and the reasons we've gone for and everybody saying, oh yeah, that makes a ton of sense, the inertia, the culture that's there just continues. And so now we've been talking lately with our, myself and some of our leaders, okay, we have, to, we have to take the road away. We have, to, we have to remove the ability to do it the old way that's comfortable. And it's gonna be painful, right? We're gonna take wrong turns, we're gonna make mistakes, people are gonna curse at us. But that's the next step we have to do because we've gotten to the spot where we've just recognized that we're not getting the change we need through gentle pushing, encouragement. We're going to have to take some drastic moves. And we, I fully expect people aren't going to like it, but there has to be a forcing factor. Um, next year when I'm back, we'll see how well that worked. But I really think there has to be something that goes in. Um, services are great. Um, but I mean, it's really, it's hard to make those changes. There has to be a very compelling, maybe it's finances, maybe it's revenue, there's a new product that comes in, those are all forcing factors. Sometimes it's a new boss comes in and really shakes stuff up. Like there has to be something that forces it and forces it not just in the meeting where you're talking about it, but forces it like the next day and when you're deciding what work you're gonna do and what you're not gonna do. Um, you have to force them. I mean, it's, and it can be, it's going to be painful, right? Anything like that's gonna be really painful. I'll be quick. Uh, sales head on. Uh, we have those services. Sales, sales head down. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, exactly these kind of conversations, where I, which I was referring to, like you know, DevOps. So what? Like you know, what is it going to bring? So we, I, I have a, I have a team of people which we call like client success team, and they are focused on the DevOps, and they can sort of measure like you know they they are proving they're talking to the CTOs and CEOs and proving them like look, this is the savings we brought you this year, and this is what I was saying like. Only now, after those like two years working with these clients, we're starting to seeing results. It just takes time. It's not something over the month. But uh, what I wanted to say is, yeah, you know, measuring the the ROIs is probably the only metric which you can which you can get out of it. And in terms of like you know what Hank was saying, there needs to be like this sort of kind of like good reason or like you know almost like something needs to happen. I really do believe this is going to be the year 2023, 2024. Um, multiple reasons. So, like, I'm already starting to hearing clients, like, for instance, go, coming to us and asking for the cost optimization in the cloud, cost optimization in the data center. They want to be more sustainable, more efficient in the data centers. Uh, they want to, like, stop spending that much in the cloud and be more efficient. So, that's one reason. The second reason, the market, the labor market, is uh, I think we were going through like five, six years where just People haven't, companies hasn't been like pushed to be more efficient. They were just hiring, you know, and throwing more bodies into into the stuff. Now, you know, with all the layoffs and stuff, actually companies are starting to being forced to be more efficient and doing more with less. So that's why I do believe I'm start seeing like signals, you know, from clients and you know how, what conversations I'm starting to having that this year and next year it's going to be different because I think this whole DevOps we lived it in like you know big prosperity as the as the economies were booing, you know, um, you know, loads of hiring and there's been like loads of people on the market. That is going to change in the next couple of years, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, that's that's why I think like these couple of years will will be will be important. Great, thank you guys. We we're just we we're just about out of time, and so I really wanted to thank you guys. Excellent panel today. Let's hear it for let's hear it for the everyone here.